Good evening. Hi, everyone. Welcome to All The Things. I am Monique Dusan, and this is the show where we talk about all things related to God, life, and the Bible. Now, if you notice that something's missing or someone is missing, Krista is not here tonight. Womp, womp, yeah. womp. Yeah, she had a work event, and she is sending her hellos and her love and her prayers, both for me and y'all. Um, because tonight, that means I'm flying solo. And I don't really know how I feel about that in my spirit. I'm a little nervous, but um, you know what? I think it'll be fine. And I'm really excited. I think more than anything, I'm so excited about our show. But before we get into all that, please take some time and comment in the comments, either on YouTube or on Facebook. And let us know where you're from. Ask questions. I'm doing my best to um, make sure that I moderate the comments on both. And then, yeah, just let us know what you think. We have an amazing show today. Please make sure to share the show. That is the best way. If you want to support the show, please share the show. Um, let's see. I'm going to just read that really quick. Um, Bob, do you have anything to say before I keep going? Uh, Hello there. Awesome. So she's not completely alone. I'm over here I'm punching buttons and stuff. I'm not completely alone. <laughs> but you're doing great. Thanks. You're doing great. Um, make sure to catch last week's replay of um, our show with Steve Lively. Sam Lively. I'm sorry. With Sam Lively. We talked about all things related to Disney and how um, we are in an age where a lot of what our children see is really reflective of culture and how a lot of the storytelling from Disney is helping to indoctrinate them into a culture that's more focused on things like critical theory. So make sure to catch that. Sam was awesome, and it's a really good show. Great. Well, thanks. Loved thanks. It. We got a little shouting section in the back. <laughs> and let's run down our show today. Um, first, we are going to talk with um, Obi and Nuju Ekoachoa. Um, I probably said her name wrong. I'm really sorry, but she's an awesome, awesome woman. She lives in the UK, but she's Nigerian born and she's a pro-life international activist. She does a lot of work, um, relating to advocacy for pregnant women and speaking out on behalf of the unborn, especially in Africa, as she sees abortion really coming in from the United States, the idea of abortion um, coming in from the United States and really being imported into the African continent with expediency. And so we're going to talk about all that and also how she sees abortion relating um, abortion topics and, and all of that being portrayed in the UK and also here in the States. And then MLK, Martin Luther King Day, is this coming Monday. We celebrate his birthday. His birthday actually just passed. I believe it was January 15th. And so we'll celebrate his life on January 15th. But we actually have some information and um, research that's little known about him. And so we'll talk about his legacy, but we'll also talk about his theology and his, his views about Christ and orthodoxy and all of that. So that is going to come later. And we don't have a tweet of the week this week because Aww. our tweeter isn't here. Aww, <laughs> so no, but we do have a really good show because of the time with um, the time difference between the UK and here, we had to pre-record the interview but it's still amazing. Feel free to ask some questions. I will do my best to answer them. And whatever we don't know or whatever I don't know, we'll make sure to answer next week. So, yeah. all right. Actually, let me give a little bit of backstory before we start playing that. Krista and I have been talking about how can we bring up the topic of abortion and pro-life issues. Last month, there was a bishop, Bishop Wooden from Upper Room, um, church of God in Christ. He's Kojic. Now, if you ever been to a Kojic church, mm, 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 you know that that thing. Mm, 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 that's all I can say. They <laughs> they have an amazing. I love like the Kojic church and um, the way they worship and all of that. But the fact that this pastor, he's a black pastor, he spoke out about abortion and the impact of abortion in the black community. Chris and I were thinking, you know what? That's really important. It's an important topic because a lot of abortion, 
facilities are usually held in lower income areas. They impact black communities at a, a, a larger proportion. And so this guy is speaking out on it. And we were like, hmm, I wonder how else we can, you know, bring this in into the show and present it to you. So let me show you this clip first. Uh, they're running a commercial on black radio. Black radio. They're not running it on white radio. They're running it on, on black radio. And they're telling the black folk on the commercials that the president has cut funding to Planned Parenthood and it's designed to uh, affect women's health care choices. And, and so this is supposed to hurt us. But what they're not telling now, black people in the commercial, the funding that he cut is abortion. And he told them, he told Planned Parenthood, I won't cut this money if you promise us with this money you won't do abortions. They say, no, we're going to keep doing our abortion. He said, then you're not going to get the money. With the way abortion disproportionately affects us, I praise the Lord for that. I think, I think that's a good move because I think we ought to live. We have a right to live. We have a right to live. We make up 13% of the population. Our women make up 8% of the 13%. And the ovulating women make up 3% of that 8%. So that 3% of women are responsible for 39% of the nation's abortions. And I thank God for every effort that slows that process down. And as we've often said, that if there's someone here today who has had an abortion and you've repented, you're forgiven, praise the Lord, but... But since they see they're targeting us, and here's what these people count on. I want this out there. They count on black people being stupid. Y'all, he said what he said. He said what he said. I am not mad at him. I am just like, wow, he put it all the way out there. And this this clip got a lot of heat. People were, you know, how can you say that? And it's our right to choose. And he said what he said. He said what he said. And they do. There is a target for lower income communities. There, there is a target toward the black community. And what we also see is that Hollywood perpetuates this idea that it's okay. It's okay to abort your baby. It's okay for you to just choose. You're choosing what's best for you. Um, it wasn't your choice to get pregnant. You just accidentally stumbled upon pregnancy. And so now you get to choose to, you know, not have your baby. And so with this thought process happening in Hollywood, I think it was taken up a notch at the Golden Globes when Michelle Williams came out. And I'm not sure if you guys saw this, but the Golden Globes are a major award show. And Michelle Williams, a prominent actress, came out and during her acceptance speech was thanking the fact that she could, you know, use or, or yeah, use her right to choose. She was giving praise to this idea and saying, you know, she's so glad that she was able to choose to have an abortion because of her career and she doesn't want to have to stop her career and things like that. So let's watch this. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, first of all, to my Fosse Verdon Oops. family and to the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. When you put this in someone's hands, you're acknowledging the choices that they make as an actor, moment by moment, scene by scene, day by day, but you're also acknowledging the choices they make as a person, the education they pursued, the training they sought, the hours they put in. I'm grateful for the acknowledgement of the choices I've made, and I'm also grateful to have lived at a moment in our society where choice exists, because as women and as girls, things can happen to our bodies that are not our choice. I've tried my very best to live a life of my own making, and not just a series of events that happened to me, but one that I could stand back and look at and recognize my handwriting all over, sometimes messy and scrawling, sometimes careful and precise, but one that I had carved with my own hand. And I wouldn't have been able to do this without employing 
a woman's right to choose. So that video immediately was everywhere being played everywhere on social media. And our guest, Uju, as we call her, um, and as she's like known everywhere, made a tweet and responded to it. And so we have that. She said, Hollywood is an ivory city built up, built on top of a bloody foundation of broken bones and bodies of innocent babies. The unacknowledged group of slaughtered victims is the group of unborn babies of Hollywood stars who have been and who continue to be sacrificed on the altar of, of success. And she said what she said. She did not mix words. And that's what I really appreciate about her. We're going to get started with this interview and I'll be right back. Okay, okay welcome, welcome to, to our, our pre-recorded, pre-recorded session. session. This, this is a time a, where we're going to talk about something really important in culture at this moment, um, abortion. We have a very special guest on. We call her Uju. Her full name is Obi Anuju Ekeocha. She is originally from Nigeria. She currently resides in the UK and she's done amazing work in in the realm of um, pro-life and really speaking out for um, justice and values of the unborn. She's a scientist and you look like you were going to jump in and say something. No, I just want to make sure that people can get her website so they get connected with her. She's the founder and president of Culture of Life Africa. And you can go to culture of life, Africa, all one word, dot mm-hmm. com. We'll have that on the, the lower. Third. Yeah. And also follow her on Twitter because she makes amazing tweets. Yes, she does. <laughs> She's they, one of my favorite. They are tweeters. out there. Just <laughs> straightforward. So good. Yes. So good. OK, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I'm really grateful to be on your show. So. Um, glad to be here today to discuss these important things with you. Yes. We're so excited to have you here. Um, would you mind by starting out, like telling us a little bit about yourself? Right. So I, uh, as you said, my name is Abiyanu Dwekocha. I am a Nigerian woman living in the United Kingdom, born and raised in the southeastern part of Nigeria, uh, had been uh, you know, had been to university at the University of Nigeria, had started working at a hospital um, in Nigeria, and then uh, came to the United Kingdom at the age of 26, uh, was living very happily. I was never really intending to do any kind of pro-life activism. I have always been pro-life, though, uh, so it's always good that I tell people that from the offset. Um, I grew up in a pro-life society, uh, grew up in a country that didn't have legal abortion. People were not agitating for legal abortion. Uh, And up to today, where I come from, people are still really not agitating for legal abortion in most parts of the country. Um, So I didn't intend to do any kind of, uh, you know, this kind of activism. But then uh, in 2012, I was um, watching television one day and I I, I saw the wife of Bill Bill Gates, uh, Melinda Gates, uh, her name is, uh, advocating for some kind of population control project in Africa. And I really got upset and, and uh, I wrote something about what she was planning to do at the time. Uh, and that then became known as the Open Letter to Melinda Gates, which went viral shortly after. And the rest is history. So that's really how I got involved in doing this kind of uh, pro-life advocacy, because it is pro-life advocacy, really. But it's a little different than what most people are used to seeing when it comes to pro-life advocacy, because I speak a lot about Africa and the Western countries in relation to African countries. Wow. Well, I'm glad that you made that tweet and that it went viral (laughs) because it's it's created such a platform to be able to speak out for the unborn. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So at the time it was, back then it was blogs. So I had written a a whole letter, you know, I wrote a 2000 worded uh, letter. Now these days we do more tweets. (laughs) So, but it was the open letter to Melinda Gates and people can still see it now if you went uh, to Google or something and search for the open letter to Melinda Gates or something, um, anything like that, you you might still be lucky enough to find it. So I've been working in this realm since, uh, I have been doing pro-life advocacy since 2012, 2013. Um, 
Uh, but I also have remained a scientist. I was always working as a scientist in the UK. I had finished my master's and I was working by the time I did this, uh, I wrote this open letter to Melinda Gates. So I, I did um, decide eventually to still remain a scientist. I work as a biomedical scientist in the area of hematology. So I, I work in pathology um, and I still actively am doing pro-life work. So it's me taking on extra duties to myself, but I think when God wants something, he, he gets to make a way so that we can, we can carry whatever it is that he wants us to carry in the way of mission. Very good. Wow. I'm so inspired already. Right. <laughs> right. It's like everyday superheroes in our midst. That's yes. Right. yes. No way. <laughs> okay. So last Sunday, I believe it was last Sunday. Yeah. A week yeah. ago Sunday. Yeah. Um, Michelle Williams came out at the Golden, at the Golden Globes and spoke openly about abortion. I believe, I believe it was her personal experience with abortion and her right to choose and things like that. And you made a pretty provocative tweet about it. What were your thoughts about her speech? Yeah, so um, we have seen Hollywood, especially in the last couple of years, becoming ever more so vocal uh, about abortion issues. Uh, as I said, sorry, I, I'll just take a bigger picture view here. I grew up in Nigeria and we were always kind of um, tied to Hollywood. We we're always so engrossed by Hollywood, even as an African girl, um, you know, looking up to America. But the America that I knew was the America we saw in movies, in good movies. So imagine me now living in the West and taking in the way uh, these Hollywood actors and actresses are advocating for abortion. What a disappointment. What a huge disappointment um, on the local scale for the American people, but also on the international scale for those of us who come from a pro-life world uh, outside of the West and who have always seen Hollywood as the real heroes, as the people who have told these stories, as the people who were, you know, the real um, j lovers of justice uh, and human rights. So Michelle Williams taking her award at the Golden Globes, talking about how her life wouldn't have been what it became had she not exercised her right to choose. Those were, I think, her exact words. Yeah. So in other words, implying that she had uh, aborted her own baby. For those people who don't know Michelle Williams very well, because I know her name is, I don't think her name is Household, but many of us knew Heat Ledger. That's Heat Ledger's wife when he died. That's Heat Ledger's widow. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a woman who, in a way, many people's hearts would have been with her. But then she's now going back telling us about this child she may have averted. We don't know if it was Hit Ledger's child. We don't know. It doesn't matter whose child it was. But what she's saying is that as a woman, or what she was implying is that as a woman, we cannot really make it in life. We cannot be success professionally successful unless we choose uh, to end or sacrifice the lives of our unborn children. What a horrible disappointment. And of course, the reaction as well to her speech or to that part of her speech, which was also something else I was tweeting about. It was the fact that she was saying uh, gladly that she aborted her child and she it led her to the Golden Globes. But then it was also the reaction of the her fellow Hollywood uh, uh, actors and actresses who were sitting there, they were all applauding. Some of them were cheering. They were, you know, um, kind of celebrating the fact that she was shouting her abortion. And I noticed uh, during the time that the camera was going round, uh, one particular woman who had also kind of been in the news. Her name is Busy Busy Phillips, who had shouted her abortion or talked about her abortion or boasted about her abortion uh, a couple of months ago. So she. She was also smiling and kind of crying and, and, and you know, rejoicing over that. It's a shame. And, and, you know, that Hollywood is setting this kind of example for women. Uh, it really is quite, quite disheartening. Yeah, it's hard to think about. I, I'm, I'm a, I guess I'm kind of a career woman. I've had a family. My faith is a, a huge part of my life and shaping the life choices that I've made. And women do sometimes have challenges and we do sometimes have to make life adjustments and we do sometimes have to uh, slow our career down. But those sacrifices seem worth it to us. And to think about killing my child for the sake of my career, I don't honestly, it's hard for me to even imagine that as a thought. But I know that 
many people do look at it that way and, and from that worldview standpoint. But it's, it, it, I don't know if it has to be either or. I've been pretty successful in my career. I've achieved a lot. And I had two children and I homeschooled them for a, a good chunk of years. And But the messages in our culture and Hollywood is certainly an icon of like, these are our values and young girls look to them. I, it's it's yes. troubling. It is very troubling, uh, uh, precisely because everyone, uh, you know, everyone is watching Hollywood uh, and people are sometimes taking their, their lives direction, in a sense of speaking, uh, from, from Hollywood. Uh, and it is a shame, really, because I believe that abortion is a human rights issue. If it is a human rights issue, the same Hollywood is out there speaking about social justice issues and, you know, they are campaigning for things and campaigning for human rights, but then they are coming out on the, one of the most important platforms and really uh, telling the world that it is all right uh, to, to kill the most vulnerable in society. Um, and they're celebrating one over that. And it's not even that Hollywood is like advocating choice. They, it, this is the on choice because they are not even making room for pro-life um, anything on their platform. Uh, if there was a pro-life uh, actor or actress, I don't believe that in this day and age, the, it, with the com current climate in Hollywood, that they can come out to give a speech and even imply that they are pro-life. That's now almost not allowed, or we're not seeing that, but we are seeing more and more people advocating for abortion, advocating for an organization like Planned Parenthood, uh, and, and moving the cause of death, really, from uh, one of the most glamorous platforms that th there is now in the world. I agree completely. Um, many things that you said were just like resonating with me. I think that the, the current cultural climate in Hollywood that promotes choice isn't just speaking to the middle-aged woman or, you know, like that 30-some-year-old woman who, you know, is is making her own choices and trying to live her own life. And, you know, that's still, you know, wrong. And I'm not saying by any means that that's okay to have an abortion just because you're trying to make your own way or anything like that. But what I am saying is that they're speaking to younger generations. They're speaking mm -hmm. to the 12-year-old, to the 11-year-old or the, the young teenager who now yeah. says, well, it's my right. It's my body. It's my right. It's my choice. And yeah. because Michelle Williams came out and said, oh, look what she did. That's also a viable option for me. And so mm -hmm. I don't I, I think that Hollywood is very aware of what they're doing. But I don't know that we as consumers or as viewers are often so aware of what is happening, what's being platformed and the message that's given to the younger audiences. Yeah. And that's why it is propaganda. That's, you know, that's what a propaganda is. It is promoted uh, through these powerful channels. But people who people who are doing it know the messaging is very conscious, is very um, well planned out, well choreographed, uh, very sleek messaging. But the people who are consuming it in most cases do not realize um, a lot of the movies that are being made now, a lot of the sitcoms that are being made now, a lot of the series that are being made now are now framing abortion. Many of them are including abortion. In fact, I read somewhere a few months ago uh, that Planned Parenthood had advised uh, uh, in Hollywood for different shows in the last couple of years about 150 times. So even within um, Planned Parenthood as an organization, PPFA, Planned Parenthood Federation of America, there is a position of a, like something like entertainment director, you know, someone whose job is to engage with um, people who are producing entertainment. So if they have such a high position within their organization, that means we all have to sit up and we have to open our eyes and see exactly the kind of propagandization that is going on with regards to abortion. Yeah. And another point you made that I wanted to hit on um, was that this is global. It may it be, is. it may appear like, oh, this is in America. But I know that when I was in South Africa, South Africa and many of the young people were emulating the things that they yeah. saw on Hollywood television. And yeah. that just goes into this whole thing and the conversation about abortion because, oh, well, if they do it in Hollywood, oh, that's how it is in America. You know, I want to do the things that they do in America. 
And so it just continues to spiral and the snowball just grows as to the things that they think are, that people think in other countries are acceptable. Yes. Uta, do you think that, do you think that we are exporting abortion into Africa and into other countries? Without a doubt. And it's happening uh, through various channels. So uh, just to finish up this last thought from Monique, it's, um, uh, it, so people who are in the other parts of the world, they're watching Hollywood productions, they are uh, watching like music videos and things like that, and they are picking up these things. Um, people associate America or other parts of the developed world, like Europe, as the better life. So the better life, everything is nicer in America. And so if abortion is being put in this, um, you know, basket of goodies, that means it has to be good. So gradually it's seeping in through culture, into other cultures that otherwise would not have been, um, you know, kind of promoting abortion or embracing abortion. Abortion is very much into the, in most parts of, of uh, the uh, African continent, um, out of the 55 African countries, four countries have what you call abortion on demand. Most of the other African countries have refu- not only they don't not only that they don't have legal abortion, but they've refused to legalize abortion. They don't want abortion. They continue to insist on it. Any time that is pushed um, towards uh, their parliaments and and different uh, houses of legislature, it's always pushed down because there is such overwhelming uh, rejection of it by the populations. So. Now, so whereas in, uh, you know, among the young people in these countries, they are now picking up, you know, the language of abortion, the very nice one, you know, the one that says pro-choice, um, the one that presents it as a woman's right to choose, as Michelle Williams said, the one that sees it as like an acceptable thing, um, as health care, as some people are now packaging it. The one I just saw yesterday and I've been commenting on since yesterday is that abortion is normal as an art exhibition in New York. York City. So all of these things sit through to, to the developing world, uh, you know, African nations, Latin American countries, even Southeast Asian countries, uh, places where, the, you know, they don't want abortion. So, but then there is another powerful channel that abortion is coming because we, for a while, we have had this propaganda coming through uh, entertainment and it's not a huge surprise. But the one that is most surprising is that governments are now in on it. Western governments are now in on it. And this is what has now made it to become um, a real exportation from the West. It's the, the, that we are having uh, the West really exporting uh, this uh, particular, uh, pro, you know, pro, what do you like, uh, this, this particular culture, which is so terrible. Uh, so in the recent times, um, EU countries have gotten very much behind funding what they're calling reproductive health in the developing world. And a, a lot of that has to do with abortion. Um, uh, you know, uh, United States in the past has also funded, unfortunately, uh, organizations that are abortion organizations like International Planned Parenthood. Now that has stopped in the last couple of years. Um, you know, the United Kingdom, where I live, uh, they have been funding a very horrible abortion organization called Marie Stopes International that we see all over the African continent. And so with government funding, very um, large amounts of funding, they are getting dollars and euros and pounds going into African countries, going into other parts of the developing world, uh, bringing in this culture, lobbying our governments uh, effectively Effectively. And so it's being done on the two levels of society. It's being done at the center of power, which is the political power. And it's also being done at the point of culture, which is really trying to get the very young people, but they're not ready to wait for those young people to grow up. So they're trying to get the young African generations. And then they are also just going straight uh, to the heart of our politics and they are fighting these battles. So just to answer your question, yes, uh, abortion is being imported uh, into Af- uh, African countries and other parts of the developing world wow, wow. that's very yeah, sobering it, it is yeah, yeah. it is like it's it very sobering yeah and yeah. yeah 
So I heard you talk in another interview about the 1994 Cairo conference. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a good moment to maybe bring that up too, because that was a pivotal moment that I think most Americans probably aren't aware of. Yeah, I wasn't. Um, Yeah, Mm -hmm. but I think it's important for us to know about that. Yeah, so in 1994, uh, the United Nations, which for people who don't know, I mean, everyone knows the UN as this one big organization, but I think how you should think about the UN is more as a collection of smaller agencies that are powerful anyway, uh, making up this giant uh, monster of an organization. So the United Nations has as part of it, uh, UNFPA, which is the United Nations Population Fund. They also have another um, uh, agency that is called the UN Women, and then they have UNICEF, and of course, everything else that people know, UNDP, they know all these other organizations that people know about. Uh, But the major ones that I'm going to talk about are these two, UNFPA and the UN Women. These are, uh, you know, kind of baby agencies of the United Nations, powerful within their own rights, uh, huge within their own rights. Get they These organizations get a lot of money from Western countries. A lot of the battle they're having now with America is that America has recently been talking about defunding in them, which, you know, they haven't had for so many years. And so they're going crazy. So UNFPA, the population control arm of the United Nations, if I can call them that, uh, in 1994, uh, they held one of the annual conferences, but this was meant to be a landmark uh, conference. The, um, the, uh, it was a conference on population and development, uh, the CPD or the International Conference uh, on Population and Development. So they went all the way to Cairo, Egypt, in Africa, to hold this particular landmark one that they said was going to change everything. They had been having it previously and, you know, talking about the populations and population growth and, you know, the different aspects of population, if you like. But when they went out to Cairo, something changed uh, because it was at the Cairo conference that they decided to bring to the level of humanitarian aid everything that has to do with reproductive health, which was not the case before. Uh, So everyone, of course, knows it's undeniable that African nations have been struggling economically. Um, It hasn't been news that people have to send food and water and all of that. You know, uh, from the 1980s, you'd see hungry children from Africa. We know these images, right? Even though, yes, uh, it's arguable. Sometimes uh, they are kind of a romanticized uh, vision of Africa, which is not necessarily always accurate. But it's not a surprise. People see African uh, pictures and all that. And it's all about, you know, if someone's risen, there's always to help Africa. So, yes, Africa has been a destination of humanitarian aid for a very long time. Um so in 1994, though, something changed because whereas the, a lot of the money going in was being allocated for food, for, uh, you know, water and sanitation, for real health care, for education, for uh, infrastructure, the economies and all of that. We never really heard it that condoms could ever really be at the same level as food and water. But that was exactly what happened in Cairo, uh, that the United Nations then um, put this um, sort of they put documents together, the so-called working document then stated that really if you decide to give $10 million worth of condom to a country in a, in a, you know, in a developing country, it's the same as giving them $10 million worth of food just to make everyone feel better. So they uh, had um, all of the discussions on all of that and, and the agreement was made. But ever since 1994, Everything has now changed on the um, uh, aid, humanitarian aid level, because all the countries, um, Western countries, especially the ones who are very much ideologically driven, then started putting a lot of money into uh, more money and more money into population control issues. And to the point that I have um, I have a graph of it that I usually show during my presentations uh, to the point where as of. Um, I think by 2013, the population control uh, funding has now 
exceeded everything else. It started as the lowest uh, in the in the 90s, but it's now come to the point where African nations are now getting um, either the equivalent, the just equal um, amounts of money for things like important things like healthcare as well as population. Uh, and even in some cases, things like education and water and sanitation are getting less and less attention. So this has really been a horrible, um, um, uh, say setback for, for African countries. Everything that it promised us will come through this kind of funding has definitely not come because it's been it's been more than 10 years. It's been, now, in fact, it's been 25 years since the Cairo conference because they've just held a 25 year anniversary of it again in Africa. They went all the way to Nairobi to hold another big population control uh, conference um, back just back in November, a couple of months ago. Uh, and, and they keep um, kind of doubling down on it, that this is the way to go, uh, uh, that to give humanitarian aid is really to give population control. That's what the Cairo conference is all about. That is what they have advocated through the United Nations ever since. Every year they still have the ICPD, that International Conference of Population Development, but usually at the United Nations, I have gone for a couple of those. And it's always, you know, very disturbing because uh, when you go there, a lot of the people you see at these conferences will be uh, the, the usual people, uh, pop, you know, um, International uh, Planned Parenthood, uh, International Planned Parenthood Federation, IPPF, you would see all the abortion, the DKT internationals, you see the so-called reproductive health organizations, they are all there and they are asking the, the United Nations for one thing, they're asking for more money, they're asking for more attention, they're asking for more access to the poor, the poor countries. Um, so it's a, a shameful thing, uh, but it's also one that we see shaping um, a lot of uh, uh, things. So is I'm taking it from your statements that uh, population control sounds like it might be a euphemism for abortion. Is is that and reproductive health? Those are two yes. terms I keep hearing you use. They sound yeah. very beautiful. They sound very pretty. But really, what exactly we're, what we're talking about is abortion. And I, I'm very kind of disturbed by that, to be quite honest, because. Um, I can see, and it, it, I think what disturbs me is I feel like the Africans are being targeted with, yes. with this, you know, that there's somewhat of a, a, your continent needs population control. We need less African people on the planet. And I don't know, is that really part of what's in play here? Is that part of the mindset? Yeah, but they are denying it all the same. They they continue to deny it and they say that it's not population control. But when you look at their budget, they actually list these things as population programs. So population programs, yes, it will include abortion, of course, but then it will also include something uh, much more um, uh, indicative of the long game that they are playing. They put in a lot of the resources for population programs into the so-called CSE, Comprehensive Sexuality Education, which has all to do with getting to the young children. So it is about uh, bringing in this kind of um, kind of re-education plan, getting into schools in the smallest villages in the most remote part of the world, teaching children these new um, terms that are like reproductive health, choice and things, these, that and the other, in places where they may not even have food and water. Nobody cares, but they're going, they're going in there and they're going there to teach them about their sexual rights, um, telling them about, you know, my body, my choice. I mean, the kind of things that we see sometimes when we go to remote places, you know, villages, I have been to villages in Africa where we couldn't find passable roads. We couldn't find clean drinking water, but we found billboards, massive billboards of condoms uh, near schools, near churches. But we are really being targeted in the most um, 
you know, in the most ridiculous ways. And the world is just staying blind to it. It's almost like, it's okay, you know, you know, first of all, nobody, it's almost like nobody cares. Um, so it's all part of the plan. It's comprehensive sexuality education. They're trying so desperately to force us to accept, um, you know, their own version and their own definition of human sexuality what, how people should be talking about sex, that it's sex without responsibilities, more sexual rights. It's not sexual responsibility, but sexual rights, which comes before anything else. But it's also where they're going to teach that. They are going and they're seeking to go to the remotest parts uh, of some of these countries, places where they need development more than anything. And still they're coming here to give them this comprehensive sexuality education as if it's really equal to development or as if it will lead to development, which we know it won't. Man, that um, actually takes me back to about eight years ago when I was in a township in South Africa called Kayamandi. And I was working with like first graders and they had a little pamphlet out, but it was about HIV AIDS. But it also included this knowledge and information about their body and about sex and how you don't get. It. And I'm like, they they like first grade, you know, and yeah. I, I have pictures of it. I have to find these pictures because I was so floored that they would have this information. They would be giving this um, information in a coloring form. So it was like you, the kids could color it in and at the same time, learn about their body, learn about HIV AIDS. How do you stay clean and all of that? And it was all written in COSA um, in a township for, you know, for grade ones. And yeah. it's like you say, you know, you have this township or this remote area and they don't have passable roads or, you know, yeah. all of the roads aren't paved or there's no running water and there aren't, um, you know, bathrooms in homes. But there yeah. is this comprehensive sex education that education. is being taught That's in the primary school to grade ones yes that's it it shows you where these very wealthy organizations and very wealthy donors where their heart truly is they have everything in their world they have everything in their in their homes and in their communities but then you go into a slum and the first thing you want to think about is let's give the coloring books to these children um, about about you know the naked human body and these are like the tiniest babies and the way they are being taught and the way you know who's teaching them that all of the things that you should really be afraid in some of a lot of these communities there's a, a very, I mean recorded um, high levels of sexual exploitation and we do know it and people don't talk a lot about it but we do know it that it is mostly during these times when you know the so-called sex education is happening between some strange teachers and children, mm -hmm. that's when these kind of sexual exploitations go on. Um, sexual abuse goes on in these yes. schools uh, through these projects. And these projects are being underwritten and being funded by Western entities. But they don't care because they come in, they throw this money down and they walk away. What, what you should be doing or what they should have been so desperate about should have been to um, be desperate that these children's level of education um, be, be important improved you know you want these children to get as much quality education as they can get so that they can leave these communities um teach them the best literature let them find the ones who are best in maths and you know get their get them through their uh their gifts out of these communities but instead they want them to stay there and yeah coloring about your body about the condoms and it was also in fact in south africa is the first place and the only place i have ever been i've been to different countries in the world um that where i've seen condoms in a restroom for free yeah you don't have to put any coin yeah you just pick it yeah you just, yeah it's it's all so, over i'm not sure if there if the statistic is still the same but a few years ago south africa had the highest rape count in the yeah. world, like anywhere, mm -hmm. they were known as the rape capital. And so yeah. it's it's like you're saying, when when we are more comfortable addressing, like, how do you stay safe or, you know, the, the whole idea of this comprehensive sex education, instead of talking about your education, talking about yes. the fact that we have issues with rape, talking about yes. all of these other issues, there's something extremely wrong. It is. Yeah. And, it, yeah. It, it's, it's horrific. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so we've talked about it on the global scale, but let's bring it back to America a little bit. Do you think that Planned Parenthood targets low income and or minority um, minority communities here in the States? Absolutely. Uh, I think it was in a uh, census a couple of years ago. Um, I've seen someone who has actually uh, done the calculations that about 79% as of that year, as of 79% of Planned Parenthood uh, facilities are located within one mile radius of a um, an ethnic minority community. Um, it is also when you very obvious and evident when you look at statistics from cities where they're collecting it. If you look at New York City, I have perused through um, the, those statistics so often and I've gone through various years to see that it's not a fluke, that the number of births, live births for black women um, is less in all those years, like four or five consecutive years, is less than the number of abortions by black women that wherever you care to check minority groups and you know and check this data following uh, ethnicity, you would see that the uh, abortion rate among black women or other ethnic minority groups is usually higher, um, much higher, significantly higher. Um, then who's aborting the babies? It's the abortion industry. Um, and they know because it's a business model. Uh, they are doing it in the United States. They're also doing it in the United Kingdom that in parts of London, where you have black and ethnic minority groups living in these um, uh, poorer, let's just call them poorer parts of London, you will always find in that neighborhood or around that neighborhood, um, the abortion industry ready uh, to take advantage. It's happening uh, everywhere where you have the, uh, you know, the poorer people, and um, even among the, the white people as well, in be it Europe or America, you will also find the targeting of the poorer ones. So uh, low income people are at risk, um, the ethnic minority people are also very much at risk. I think I'm I'm very concerned because in America, I think somewhere around like 12 to 13 percent of our population is African-American. Then, you know, if you if you say that women are roughly half of that, let's say that they're about eight percent, seven, eight percent of the population. But then some percentage of that are actually ovulating and capable of having a pregnancy, you know, maybe yes. you're at like 5% or something of the total population is having like 30% of the abortions. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, it seems so disproportional. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it does, at least on just a superficial look at the statistics, it does seem like the black community, ethnic minority communities are being targeted to, to some degree by, by, abortion clinics, Planned Parenthood, and that sort of thing. Yeah, and also the messaging. You will see it in the messaging. Last year, there was a day I just sat through. I said, I'm going to sit uh, online, and I was going through some of the abortion organizations, particularly in America, because they're very, let's say they're very good in social media, if I can say that. They're constantly, you can, you can see that they're playing their, you can see their hand, you can see what they're planning by going through their social their social media pages or platforms, if you have the time, just do that. That any time I see something like Nero um, doing a, a kind of advertisement or they're doing a publicity thing, they use black women a lot. They use, you know, what you call in America, women of color. Okay, I'm not American, so <laughs> so yeah. So I always see American saying the women of color. So yeah, they always find a way to use black women. Um, in their art or in their uh, pub publicity things done. So even when they, they write articles, you know, these uh, pro-abortion websites, even the, the um, websites like Reuters. So it's they do use black women um, whenever they're talking about choice, body right, you know, or they're fighting um, any kind of pro-life law that comes out in Alabama or wherever. If you see the article... Most times um, it, they will use a black woman um, to show that we, you know, they're taking away rights. They're taking away our rights. So they're using black women constantly um, as a, a shield 
for the entire abortion industry. But if you think about it, who is in charge in the abortion industry? Uh, you know, Sister Richards is people in that class. This is the elite, the people who themselves are living in mansions. Um, a lot of the abortionists, these are people who, these are the elite, and they are using the poor people who will then go back to the squalor of their communities when they, uh, you know, finish aborting their babies. But the money, at the end of the day, the money they are bringing into the abortion industry is, un is unthinkable. And the abortion industry continues um, to, in a way, continues to grow as a monster uh, on the blood of the innocent babies being aborted, as well as the money um, of, of the poorest people, of the poor. That's yeah, we just sit down, sit here. We need to just breathe for I a know, minute. because that is powerful. <laughs> I have so many thoughts, but go ahead with your question. Well, I was just going to say that, um, you know, I don't really know what I was going to say okay. anymore. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. I don't. I have to, I have to collect myself. Yeah. Because it's yeah. true. You know, one of the things I was thinking is that they do use, and here we have this term about black bodies. And so you will see black bodies before um, like abortion ads or in front of abortion ads and things like that. Um, but we also have this huge conversation happening right now about diversity. And so mm. I feel like it's a double-edged sword. Like, you know, we want to make sure that our, our ads are diverse. And so we're going mm. to use a black body or a woman of color to mm -hmm. promote this um, reproductive health or abortions. And it's like, it's really just... It's really just a double stab. Like when your diversity kill. becomes targeting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they know what they're doing, though. They yeah. do know what they're doing. Uh, it is. Uh, it's very unfortunate that when they push so hard for that diversity is when, yeah, when it has to do with abortion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's the black babies that don't make it. Yeah. It's, you know, it's the the, the offspring uh, of, of the African-Americans that just are not there. Uh, and the populations of the African Amer Americans should have been higher by now, um, it, you know, with regards to the rest of the population. But it's not because the, you know, a lot of the babies are, are going by way of uh, Planned Parenthood. Um, it's it's really unfortunate, uh, and that there are politicians as well um, sitting in your capital who are fighting constantly, shamelessly, uh, for the right. Uh, to for women to be able to to have their babies killed, um, it's a, a horrible thing. Which I think we will see the full repercussions of it in history, and hopefully history should should take note uh, and and keep the record exactly where uh, history has kept very very carefully and very well the records of things uh, like slavery. Um, it those those things those records. I'm hoping that it doesn't fall off the way that we would know in time who supported what uh, and and uh, what what you know how vicious were they in their advocacy and how how careless were they in their advocacy because uh, they're all going on record and saying all of these things. Um, history will not forget. One day abortion is really going to be uh, completely overturned because science science is really moving very quickly. As I said, I am a scientist myself and I work in healthcare and we see these uh, incredible advancements and I keep wondering for how long uh, is abortion going to you know, continue with all these things that we now know with new technology, with everything that we know, uh, so much, uh, so much um, new treatments are being devised where babies can be treated while they are still in the womb, where even uh, intricate surgeries can be done while the baby is still in the womb and the, the pregnancy and gestation continues and the baby is born at the right time or close to the right time. How long are we going to be able to uh, continue to tell the lie uh, that the child in the womb can be disposed of when we are also putting in a lot of money to save the life of that baby or to make the life of that baby better by giving treatment long before, uh, long before birth? I work uh, in hematology and there are actual tests that we do to find out things like blood group of a baby long, long, long before the baby is born. So science is really advancing and I'm so grateful for that. That's one thing I love really about just, you know, life in the West is that we see science moving.
moving and it's moving in affirmation of the uh, sanctity of human life. And I'm praying that society will come together and rally together and have the real courage, the real courage it will take to, to overcome abortion. And yes, I know women go through a lot of problems. As you had mentioned at the beginning, uh, we have challenges. We, ha we have, um, you know, so many things to deal with in, in some cases. Uh, but I also know that society can and has changed for the better, that people are making more room for women to give women care, to meet women at the point where they need help, to give help to women who are in crisis situations, to accompany women who are, in, who are, being, who are fearing for their lives or, you know, those who feel they really desperately have to abort their babies in order for them to survive maybe an abusive relationship or, or something. Uh, no, society is getting much better. And I hope that we get all that much better that women can then, good women can get that real assurance that society is with us. And so we can together um, abolish this horrible, horrific practice called abortion. Well, that's such a good place to, to land the interview, Uju. And I just, as I was reflecting on what you were saying just now, I was thinking about the great loss of all the potential future scientists and priests and politicians and mothers and fathers and and others who could contribute to making the world better, who could contribute to improving things and finding cures for diseases. Um, and I just love how you, you ended that in such a, a positive place because our hope is that someday th this atrocity will be overturned and we will have a different sensibility as a, uh, as across the board in all countries that, that human mm -hmm. life is valuable and that we want to work to cultivate life rather than, yes. than death. Yes. So, yeah. One of the things that um, I wanted to ask you at the beginning and I completely um, <laughs> skipped over it and forgot, but um, I know that you're a woman of faith and I wanted, I wondered like, how does your faith um, impact you or, um, compel you to speak out about these things? Yeah, that's fine. I know you wanted to ask it at the beginning, but it's good that we can still talk about it towards the end because I think it's also like another good place to to kind of round things out. Um, so I am a woman of faith. I am my, I, I'm a Catholic. I am a devout Catholic. And yes, I am also a scientist. And a lot of my convictions I have supported uh, by science. So I know when I see the things at my workplace or, you know, in my own experiences and in, you know, in reading the scientific papers and things like that. Um, so that is the one thing. So the conviction is there and the conviction can be there even for people who are not yet convinced by faith. But this is what my faith does. In this fight that we fight, we do have real opponents who could even qualify as enemies who see us as enemies uh, when you see them reject pro-life people you would know that we do have enemies even if you don't call them that um, but my faith then compels me to not hate my enemies to love them and to still be um, clear in the message but also find my find a way within my life and within myself to be able to love in the midst of the mission, uh, doing whatever it is. So the faith does keep me going. The, the faith also uh, ensures that I, I don't um, get tired or get weary, you know? So every morning God wakes me up and then you, 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 are sometimes just tired of what you're seeing. You go online, you're tired of what's going on. Uh, but then God then comes with the courage that can only come from him and gives me the ability to just keep going, um, the ability to keep moving, knowing that even if I don't see the results of what is being uh, done and all the work that we are doing, um, it doesn't matter, it's for him. So even if I die doing this, uh, even if I never get to see the end of this, um, it still doesn't matter because the work has gone in into his vineyard and it stays. It stays and it's meant to outlive us. So that's fine. It's going somewhere. It's for something. And at the end of the day, it's really for the love of God. So uh, the faith does keep the work going and it, it, it ensures that 
uh, that I never lose sight of what is most important, which is that the God is the author of life and everything that we do at the end of the day in all of this fight for human rights. Yes, it's for human rights, but at the end of the day, it's all because we are all made in the image and likeness of God Almighty. Amen and amen. <laughs> yes. Good. Well, thank you so much for joining us and talking thank with you. us. It's been amazing. Thank you. So yes. informative. Thank you. Very much so. Thank and I you. want to encourage people to get connected with Uju. Yes. Yes. Um, Find follow- me on Twitter. Yes, yes. Twitter. O B I A N U J U. That's yes. it. Yeah. And yeah. then uh, check out the website at cultureoflifeafrica.com. Yes. yes. Thank you so much, Uju. It's just a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. It's a pleasure, too. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a good evening. (laughs) Thank you. All right. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, and (gasps) the magic of... (laughs) She she arrived. (laughs) She arrived. You guys, well, welcome before I get... Welcome back. Yes. We missed you. Oh, thank you. It was a rough, you know, 15 minutes without you. I'm glad you're here. (laughs) Okay. Um... You guys, that interview, so much wisdom put forward, so so many thoughts. Oh, my gosh. I was thinking about that, like, all day. Just the fact of some of the statistics that she brought out, that there's more aid going forward into Africa right now in many of the countries than there is money going toward, like, things for water and sanitation. Or that there were more black babies dying than there were, you know, being born in New York. New York. Yeah. There's so much information, and I, I think that a lot of times we don't understand just how grave the situation is um, at this current cultural moment. Yeah. Because, yeah, like everyone, or well, we do anyway, I, I'll speak for myself. I hate abortion. I am definitely pro-life. And I think that that is where, you know, I'll speak from and say, you know, no, abortion's wrong, but I don't understand all the time of why it's so wrong and exactly what's happening on the back end to promote abortion. Okay. It's, it's been a, I think this is a journey that we will continue to be on. We have other interviews in mind to continue the, the The conversation, the conversation about pro-life issues and, I'm looking forward to those things, but Uju was just amazing and so gracious and so generous. Uh, yes. She tweeted us today, yeah. and Monique's phone was going phone crazy. Just went off. It was crazy. It was so crazy. Yeah. Uh, but you also mentioned, and I forgot to mention this, that the women's march the was women, today. The women's march was today in Washington D.C., and then they had satellite marches in in other and what cities. Is the women's march exactly? Well, it started the kind of the first one was, um, I, th- I guess it was maybe three years ago now when Trump was first inaugurated, mm-hmm. and it was a couple weeks after, or a week, or I don't know, days after the inauguration. And it's uh, people can go look at us. Uh, their website is womensmarch.com, and you could read their agenda. And it's just such a timely interview because I was telling you um, earlier today, I was looking at their website. And I was like, okay, what do these people stand for? Am I this kind of woman? I don't think I'm this kind of woman because I see on a big balloon right on their agenda page about reproductive rights and justice, mm-hmm. which is exactly what Uju was, yeah. was educating us about. And I'm like, but- Oh, now I know what this means. The rights and justice for whom? Yes. You know, it's it. that's where things get a little murky is that we talk about social justice. We talk about rights, but those rights aren't for everyone. Yeah. And they don't seem to be for the unborn yeah. in, in this agenda. So anyways, I don't think I'm that kind of woman. For the, <laughs> but I know they, they, they want to speak for us, but I, I don't think we're those kind of women. Yeah, the, we're not going to be wearing pink hats out in the uh, Washington Mall. So there were some comments. Yeah, let's get while to those. we played the interview back, you want to take the comments? Well, we had some. Uh, I thought you made a really good summary of in many countries, abortion gets more funding than things like water and sanitation. I mean, I think that's a really good takeaway from this this interview. Uh, Kimba said that. Um, Funny how having sex is never what it is, the the choice in their Annette argument. Annette said that too. Annette and Kimba both okay. said something to the effect of, um, you know, it's funny how sex is never the choice or sex isn't what we're regulating. Um, and 
I agree with that. And I also just think that that's the current worldview that people, the lens that people are looking through. It's about what feels good for me, what is going to be best for me. And if I don't like it, then I don't have to deal with it. Yeah. Uh, Maria says she's a little less optimistic about society's future with abortion. Uh, that I th- I think that what she's saying than Uju, and I, mm-hmm. I pray that Uju is right. Uju is very, uh, she was very optimistic. In her yeah. mind, one day abortion will be looked upon the same way that we look upon slavery. Yeah. It, it will be outlawed and it will be looked on as being morally reprehensible. I hope she's right. Yes. I hope that's a true and prophetic word because uh, it's, things are pretty bad right now. And <clears throat> we should probably say like, you know, in, in our worldview as Christians, um, sometimes people make choices to have abortions before they're saved, before mm-hmm. they, they know Christ. Yeah. Um, one of my coworkers, she and I have had several conversations to this effect about how she had an abortion when, in, um, when she was very young. I think she was like maybe 20 or something. And in, she didn't know Christ, and she thought, you know, that was just what she should do. Mm -hmm. She just, it didn't occur to her. And then she said, after she became a Christian within like minutes after she became a Christian, the Holy Spirit just convicted her of, oh my goodness, Mm -hmm. I killed my child. Wow. And so no matter where people are in their journey, we do want to assure them that, you know, there's, there's forgiveness, Mm -hmm. there's grace. Grace. um, And, if people have been injured in terms of an abortion emotionally, and, and it's, it's a, often a traumatic event, um, there's help. If you go to your local pregnancy resource center, they usually have small groups uh, to help people recover from that trauma. My, I have a very good friend who has been leading those groups for years, mm-hmm. and she's a, an abortion survivor. She had three abortions and now is a very dedicated leader to helping other women come out of that trauma. So, you know, there's no shame. There's no condemnation in Christ. And, you know, there's forgiveness for that. Uh, So we don't want to be tackling this sensitive topic without at least saying a word about that. Yeah. And we also don't want to enter it in a place of like condemnation and judgment. Yeah. You know, but we will speak out and speak truth into the matter and the situation. That yeah. it is murder. It is killing. Um, Kimba says, Kimba says, I don't know any woman that has had an abortion that hasn't suffered emotionally. Uh, but the, you never hear the other side talk about that part. And that's, that's very true. It's not talked about very much. I mean, recently there was a Twitter campaign of like, shout your abortion or some hashtag. Oh. And I thought, wow, that's sort of vile. Uh, but yeah, you just don't hear the other side talk about that. No, I, I too have friends who have had abortions and, you don't hear about the the ugly side of the after, you know, yeah. what happens after, after I get home, yeah. after I, I've done this and now I need to wrestle with my emotions and guilt or, you know, yeah. all of those things. Yeah. So again, we'll continue these conversations. And but this was a good one. This was, I really oh, like this one. Share this. Share. You share guys, yes. Share we have this to have talk about the share. This is well, I need one. powder. I've been working all day. Like this is, this is not okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry folks. <laughs> I don't know okay. what to say. Should we go on? Yes. All right. So the mega Martin show. Luther King. All right. Yeah, yes. It, the mega show. People, fasten your seatbelts. Buckle in. Um, <laughs> Martin Luther King. Junior. His, junior. Yes. Whose real name was Michael. Yes. Yes. I, I learned that. Yes. His, his real name is Michael. Mm-hmm. And he was a Michael King Jr. Uh-huh. Um, and then his father went on like some trip. And I want to say it was a trip to, I don't know, some religious place. I don't really know my religious places, folks. Let's just be clear. <laughs> but he went on a trip to a religious place. And he was, his father was a pastor, like a devout Orthodox pastor. B- Baptist. Like he, yeah, minister. Baptist. But yeah. he believed like in Orthodoxy and all that and changed his name. And then changed his son's name because they will be Martin Luther. And yeah. I was like, that's deep. Now. Uh, yeah, are you going to change your name to Mary? No. <laughs> you can have Mary one, Mary two. No. I don't know. No. Okay, never mind. All right. So MLK is a federal holiday. It's coming up on Monday. Yes. So we thought it would be good to spend a little time talking about that. Now, I jokingly refer to it as Black People's Day. Okay. <laughs> I know that's probably horrible. I'm probably not allowed to joke about that but since I'm white. <laughs> I, 
I do. I feel like that is, that's, that's our day. It's his birthday. Yes. And, um, you know, there's many people that really respect, I call it, they, they almost sort of venerate MLK. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and we sort of make fun of Catholic and Orthodox Christians or venerating saints, but there's some people that I think border on venerating MLK. Like you can't say anything against him. It's he's almost like kind of like y'all do with C.S. Lewis. You know, like Let's the fourth be real. Of the trip. Let's be real. Something. Yeah, you ever talk to somebody about C.S. Lewis? Ooh, C.S. Lewis. <laughs> he done, done it. I learned everything. I took a class because of C.S. Lewis. And then you come mm-hmm. here and then you're like, mm-hmm. who's he? Exactly. Who's who is he? he? Exactly. Our friend Lori Stewart takes us to a play on C.S. Lewis, and she's like. Who is this guy? <laughs> but I knew Lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe. Lion, Lion, yeah, Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe. Yes, yeah. I oh didn't know gosh. that. But um, yes, okay. okay, you get the day off. I probably will not have the day off. But um, yes, so we do hold the Reverend Doctor Martin Luther Reverend King Dr. So, in very high esteem. So I'm glad that you said that he's a Reverend and a Doctor because yes, I, I kind of always wondered like. Was he a real doctor? And I went to the MLK Museum when I was in Atlanta a couple years ago, and he earned a PhD yes, he did. in theology mm-hmm. from uh, Boston University, which is a Catholic university, I believe, in 1955. I got to go to uh, his church, Ebenezer Baptist Church. I really encourage people, if you're in Atlanta. To- Al- Atlanta? Yeah. For some reason, I did not think it was in Atlanta. Yeah, it's in Atlanta. Oh, um, there, there was another state I was thinking of. He was shot in Memphis. Yes. But he lived in Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. So go back. If you can go back to the first picture, that's the church. It's on the street corner there. I love this one because it's like from the 60s or something. And it still pretty much looks like that. What they've done is they preserved the, the that church and then they preserved the whole city block. All the houses on the block are look like you're just walking into this time capsule from the early 60s. Wow. And all the houses are painted exactly the way that they were then. They've preserved the whole street. So his his family lived in a house just like, I don't know, like a couple hundred feet from the from the church. So he he grew up in the house and then lived in the house. And there's a big mega church now that's on the opposite street corner. That's the real Ebenezer Baptist Church. It's like the new Ebenezer Baptist Church Mm -hmm. where you can go. And that's where people go today. But you can go into that old one and you can uh, tour. It was very cool. They have like a loop of him preaching. They do. It's so moving. You can go sit in the balcony section. I don't know if I, if, but yeah, that's just what it looks like on the inside. So I was up in that balcony. With all those people? No, there's no people. Okay, but I, I was this, just making sure. I picked this picture because I think um, it just is nice in how it depicts, you know, a very typical service back then. But you can go sit in that balcony area and they have a, a an audio on loop of him preaching a sermon. It's very moving. Mm. It, was, it was very moving. I sat there for quite a while and listened. And I'm kind of a nerd about historic churches. I really love historic churches. Even so. when she says she loves historic churches, <laughs> she really wants to buy one and fill it like with all kind of turn it in, kind of stuff. Yeah. She wants a pew in our house. <laughs> Folks, what? can someone pray for us? <laughs> yes. My dream is that after the children grow up and move away, like we redecorate the house and sort of make it look like with church themes, like stained glass windows and stuff and a pew and, Fill it with Johnny Cash memorabilia, but I digress. Okay. <laughs> Tracy says, you should come to New Hampshire. We have lots of historic churches here. No. Yes. Then she will Tracy, have ideas. bring us. Ideas. Yes. No. Book us a, a, a speaking gig at a conference. So we can I don't come. want a pulpit in my bedroom. <laughs> oh, that's so fun to go stand behind the pulpit in historic churches. I love doing that. But and, we digress. Okay. All right. This is me. Okay. So his theology. So let's talk about that. Well, okay, wait. Before we oh. get to his theology, okay. let's talk about why we celebrate him. Why, why do he we? is like because he was such a voice for black people. Like when when he came on the scene, 
And I feel like he was like the beginning of the civil rights era. He was the one who really said, you know what? No, I know that people are like throwing water hoses on you and they're letting their dogs loose on you and they're spitting on you and you can't drink from the same water fountain or use the same bathroom. But we are not going to participate and retaliate the way that people may expect us to. We are going to peacefully protest. We are going to show our resistance in a different way. Because at the same time, you had um, Malcolm X, who was by any means necessary. And so that was his philosophy by any yeah, means. Yeah, by any means necessary. And King wasn't like that. Now we'll talk about him being a pacifist and things yeah. like that. But I really think that he spoke into this idea that no matter what someone else says about you, you have like purpose. You are created in God's image. You have dignity, value, and worth. He was speaking a different message than what a lot of people had heard. Now, there are tons of Black people who do not agree with his agenda at all, who would, who were completely for the, like, the Malcolm X side. Like, no, we mm. need to go ahead and knock buildings down. We need to riot. We need, And he said, no, that's not how we're going to do things. So there was sort of a, a, a time where these two co- philosophies were competing of how are we going to overcome segregation? How are we going to overcome Jim Crow laws? Are we going to do it the MLK way or mm-hmm. the Malcolm X way? Okay. And I think till, still today there are people who will be like, you know, no, we, we need to, you know, by any means necessary. I was just somewhere last year and I heard that exact phrase by any means necessary we will you know march forward we will knock down oppression and those kind of things and I just think his voice is so important because he did not stand for that that's interesting because um growing up as a Baptist and there was a I mean this very historic church where he grew up his father was a pastor there as well um, but then he goes off to seminary, and in the early part of the 20th century, there's this rise of this movement called neo-orthodoxy, and it's sort of a version of classical liberalism. Um, and uh, MLK is heavily influenced by this. He mm-hmm. reads a lot of uh, German neo-orthodox scholars, um, and he starts um, kind of— working on his theology of pacifism. Gandhi was a very big influence of his in seminary. And he kind of goes through a process where, I mean, you, you just listen to any MLK speech or sermon, the images are highly influenced and tied to and tethered to Christianity. But he's this kind of mix of historic Christian terminology, but through the lens of classical liberalism and neo-orthodoxy. He really is a pro- a product of t- 20th century theology in, in many regards. And, but I think what's really interesting to me about MLK is that he had a very well-developed um, theology of work and of humanity. When we call this in, the technical term for this in theology is anthropology. He had a very rigorous doctrine of man. And I think it was mostly correct. I think that it was a good and helpful corrective to um, the church at this time. And uh, he really just had a very robust theology of what it meant to love your neighbor in a very tangible way. He wasn't interested in just talking about heaven as some pie in the sky thing. He wanted to fig- he wanted to have conversations about how do we love our neighbor now? Mm-hmm. How do we bring the kingdom of God here now? And how do we build up each other's dignity in the image of God and and see people as inherently valuable? So it's from that theological foundation. I actually think is very orthodox and sound that he builds his intellectual project of the civil rights struggle. And I think it's important to put him in that context is that that part of it really came out of his theology. Yeah. So is it okay if we play the clip? You know, or did you want to add a comment to that? No, no. Okay. Nope. I'm going to save my comments for the end. Okay. 
Except for Maria says that she used to have a pew and she's still looking for one. And I was like, whoa. See, Maria gets me. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. That's my language right there. Okay. So we're going to listen to a little excerpt. You can go on YouTube and watch the whole thing. But what I love about this is it's from a junior high school. MLK goes to a speak at a junior high school in 1967. And I'm thinking, this is this is how far we've fallen, people. You would never get junior hires to listen to a speech like this now in the age of the internet. This is a fantastic speech. Go watch the whole thing. It's only like 25 minutes or something. We're just going to play a little clip here. Number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your own worth, and your own somebodiness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you are nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth. And always feel that your life has ultimate significance. Now that means that you should not be ashamed of your color. You know, it's very unfortunate that in so many instances, our society has placed a stigma on the Negro's color. And you know there are some Negroes who are ashamed of themselves, don't be ashamed of your color. Don't be ashamed of your biological features. Somehow you must be able to say in your own lives and really believe it, I am black but beautiful. And believe it in your own. And therefore, you need not be lured into purchasing cosmetics advertised to make you lighter. Neither do you need to process your hair to make it appear straight. I have good hair, and it's as good as anybody else's hair in the world. And we've got to believe that. Now, in your life's blueprint, be sure that you have that a principle of somebodyness. Secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have as a basic principle the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. You're going to be deciding as the days and the years unfold what you will do in life, what your life's work will be. And once you discover what it will be, set out to do it and to do it well. And I say to you, my young friends, that doors are opening to each of you. Doors of opportunity are opening to each of you that were not open to your mothers and to your fathers. And the great challenge facing you is to be ready to enter these doors as they open. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great essayist, said in a lecture back in 1871 that if a man can write a better book or preach a better sermon or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. That hadn't always been true, but it will become increasingly true. And so I would urge you to study hard, to burn the midnight oil. I would say to you, don't drop out of school, and I understand all of the sociological reasons why we often drop out of school. But I urge you, in spite of your economic plight, 
in spite of the situation that you are forced to live so often with intolerable conditions, stay in school. And when you discover what you're going to be in life, set out to do it as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. And just don't set out to do a good Negro job, but do a good job that anybody could do. Don't set out to be just a good Negro doctor, a good Negro lawyer, a good Negro school teacher, a good Negro preacher, a good Negro barber, a beautician, a, a good Negro skilled laborer. For if you set out to do that, you have already flunked your matriculation exam for entrance into the university of integration. Set out to do a good job and do that job so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. I kind of love that. Good old Uncle Dr. Reverend Martin. Yeah. I, I actually watch that whole speech from time to time. It's a good one. Well, let me ask you a few questions about it. Okay. Some things that he says there. Again, this is junior hires, people. He's quoting Emerson to junior hires. He's using words like matriculation. I love that. This is how far we have fallen as a culture. Okay. So let me ask you, why does in the beginning, I, I well, first of all, I love it that he talks about this idea of somebodiness. Mm -hmm. That's a theme that you hear in a lot of his speeches of don't ever let somebody tell you you're not somebody. Don't mm -hmm. let them deny your somebodiness. To me, that is very echoing of the idea of being created in the image of God, mm -hmm. having value, dignity, and worth. Yeah. Maybe you could comment on that. Why do you think that was an important, timely issue for him? I think it was important because even though slavery had well ended maybe 100 years before, during that time, we were not considered full people, full human, you know? And so then you now have to kind of unwind yourself from all of that. What does all of that mean? Like I understood or they understood that they were full people, but according to the law, they weren't. And so how do we now teach people, teach young black people when so many derogatory words are being spoken over them, when systems aren't fair and society isn't fair when they can't go some places or they can only go in certain places that you still have dignity, value, and worth. Yes, your current society may be corrupt and misled and full of sin, but that does not dictate nor change who you are intrinsically. Yeah. I love that. Just know your own somebodiness. Mm -hmm. I love that. The other thing he talked about there is about the hair. Now, we did a, a segment on hair mm -hmm. a couple months ago about the black experience and hair. Yes, and I now have braids. <laughs> yes, I do. And it's all colored in the back. Yes, all kind of colors. Um, so why does he say, be proud of being black, be proud of your hair? Like, why is he telling junior high kids that? Because hair, skin color, eye color... In society at that time was one way. It was white. It was blue eyes. It, it was, was straight, straight hair. Yeah. And if you didn't have that, then you weren't beautiful. Beautiful. You know, if you were a darker skinned black person compared to a lighter skinned black person, the darker skin wasn't as beautiful as the lighter skin. You either had good hair or you had bad hair. You had good hair or you had naps. And that's those are even still words that play in culture today. But what he's saying is don't judge yourself based on the person with straight hair. Your hair is beautiful. Hair is beautiful. And so I just I think it's important to be to instill those messages, especially at that time into young people to say, hey, you're you're going out into the world soon and you are beautiful. You are somebody. Yeah, I love that. God has created you a certain way and your hair a certain way and your skin a certain color. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. You don't need to bleach your skin or straighten your hair. However, it comes out of your head, you know, that's yeah, part of your dignity. Your skin was very real. I don't know if anybody still does it today, but it was very real and things like a perm, which black people call perms, not a white perm. It would, 
also be called a relaxer. So it makes it straight. It makes it straight. For white people, a perm is makes it curly. Makes it curly. But I mean, yeah. perm started out with lie. People putting lie on your hair <laughs> to make it straight. You know, like there there were big extremes that we went to to make sure that we were considered beautiful. We talked about this on the Brady Bunch a couple months ago when I was like, oh, look, everybody's eyes are blue. And you were like, you just dashed my childhood. But this <laughs> I never is, noticed that. This is, <laughs> yeah. these are things that I noticed because these are things that were presented as being beautiful. So that message at that time would have been really countercultural for black people to be proud of who, the, not who they are, but, but added to that, like behind that is the theology of yes. my dignity as a somebody, as a created person, the way God created my hair, my skin, my eye color, that is beautiful. Yes. That's really what he was saying, yeah. you know. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up was his theology of work that he talked about in the second half of the clip. Um, that every human being, this was a critical part of MLK's theology, that every human being not only had intrinsic value, but that all labor has dignity from the white collar worker to the, to the sanitation worker. And he was part of the, he gave a very famous speech um, as part of the sanitation strike. And he does, does the part about don't ever let somebody diminish your somebodiness in that speech because the, he was trying to teach them that even the, the culture society may see you as a lowly sanitation work you worker you are still somebody and that is a very powerful part of his theology that i think is is very good and robust and biblically accurate um i in another thing that we talked about a third point is just he had an extremely robust view of loving your neighbor yeah. and exploring that and um uh, so anyways, there's, there's just a lot of really good themes there, um, that I think are worth celebrating and being knowledgeable about in MLK's theology. Now for the more kind of, uh, I'll call it area of concern areas of, that, that's, that's that people good, may not be aware yeah, of. Yeah. And to me, it, I, I battled, I honestly did. I, I battled with this part of it today. Um, but after we kind of go through some of the areas of concern, I'll say why I think it's important that people know about this. Okay. Well, as I said earlier, MLK was a classical liberal. He did rethink historic Christianity through the lens that, you know, that he had grown up with more of a historic Christian faith in the a traditional Baptist setting. But then he kind of detaches from that a little bit in seminary. And so he kind of picks up what we would now call more of a social gospel. And, and um, he did reject a lot of what he called biblical liter literalism. Um, for example, he didn't believe in the story of Jonah was a real story, a uh, real historical event. He ref There's record of him referring to the Bible as mythological. He doubted whether Jesus was really born of a virgin um, I think I have a graphic here um, from a paper. There's a, um, yeah, there's Stanford is preserving a lot of uh, King's lesser known writings. You can go search for this essay, The Humanity and Divinity of Jesus, where he talks about his theology. And this is a seminary paper. So keep that in mind. <laughs> um, you know, it's a, it's a seminary paper. Mm -hmm. And so, but he has some some discussion in here where he denies the orthodox view of Christ's divinity. Um, he thinks that he was divine, but not in the not in the, the normal sense the of like that he's yeah. all God. Yeah. Um, but that I was when I was reading it, I was like, what like what do you believe? It's not that yeah. he grew into his divinity, but that his divinity came because of his obedience. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, I haven't heard it that way before. Yeah. So he was um, kind of born human and then he became God sort of through obedience. Through obedience. It's um, a very unorthodox view of Christ's divinity. Yeah. And so in the end, he even says that the orthodox view is basically wrong. Yeah. Like he, he pretty much is clear, you know, yeah. in saying that. So he would be definitely out of step with, you know, the ancient faith traditions of Catholic and Orthodox and, and even 
the historic Protestantism. He he was definitely a 20th century classical liberal, um, neo orthodox liberal. It, I would squarely place him in that tradition. So, you know, I think that with MLK, it, you know, we have to kind of think of him as a somewhat of a complicated being. Like there's some people who are saying, oh, he denied, you know, the divinity of Christ. So therefore he's not a Christian. I'm in no position to judge that. Yeah. I don't know. It's not my that's place. Not, that's not, not my business. My place. God hasn't made me the judge over that. Uh, that's the Lord's business. I, I, he doesn't have a hundred percent heretical beliefs. He does have some beliefs that technically I would say are outside of Christianity, but he also, like I said earlier, has a very robust theology of work and robust theology of, of man. So those are good things. And I'm just trying to put him in his historical context. So maybe you can just talk a little bit about his legacy. I think it's important that people understand this part because as a kid growing up, every Martin Luther King day, there's the Martin Luther King day parade. I don't know where all of you guys live, but usually Martin Luther King street, Martin Luther King junior Boulevard is what it was always called in every state that I've been to. I find one, but it's usually like in the lower income area. And I'm, I don't really know what that's about. If it's like a, we can only put it here, but, um, usually wherever I've been Martin Luther King day parade, no matter what state I've been in, the parade is going down, folks. You have the high school bands out. You have people selling, well, usually selling bean pies. In L.A., I mean, I grew up in L.A. And What's so, a bean pie? Oh, they're like the little Nation of Islam pies. They're a little bean, yeah. It's a whole nother show, whole nother topic. But you or you have I people- I Google that. All right, um, bean Selling pies. CDs and DVDs, um, probably usually bootleg. <laughs> but there's, like, it's a whole- situation and event um and it's it's a lot of fun it is and in church though on martin luther king day like the sunday before they're talking about it there's some kind of showcase a a kid does a speech like something and um but what i was going to say was it's important to also bring it full light full circle so that we can understand like we we promote him in church as being someone who held to orthodoxy we pre- we um present him as being you know fully the, christian and fully was- christian you know he didn't you know question scripture yeah. you know father son holy spirit martin luther king it, so I think it's important that we have realistic views of people as well because we're people. And when when we are presenting someone to me before the congregation, I think it's important to know like, hey, this is what he believed as well. And that doesn't diminish his work. He he did amazing work. Yeah. And he also had these views that don't line up exactly with scripture. Yeah. And so how do we how do we hold both? And it's a it, it's complicated. You and I have had so many conversations about people in history and I'm like, well, on the one hand, they did this really noble thing. And on the other hand, mm-hmm. they were kind of shady in this way. And people are complicated and, and somewhat messy. And with MLK, I mean, there's all these rumors about him being, you know, having extramarital affairs and, and, you know, that whole part of it too. And so our purpose here is not to vilify him, but just to say like somebody can, uh, can have a legitimate legacy, do good work and have a noble contribution to society. And at the same time have troubling views and troubling behaviors. And that's the messy world of being a sinner. Yeah. And so we have to look at it, you know, in a fully orbed way. So. Yeah, but I thought um, I learned I learned quite a few things doing this and reading um, the thing put out by Stanford. And at the end of the day, I'm like, good old Uncle Dr. Martin, Reverend Luther King, you know, (laughs) Um, you know, I'm I'm thankful for his work. I'm thankful for the stand that he took. Yeah. Uh, And, you know, he also has views that don't line up with mine. Yeah. And it doesn't negate my gratitude for the life and legacy that he lived so that we could move forward in society. That's a good word. Okay. We better wrap it up here on the mega edition. This really is a mega edition. All right. Real quick. We're going to have the tweet. Oh, 
Y'all, she came back and she came with a tweet. Cause remember, I was like, we don't have no tweet, but we did. Uh -oh. Okay. Oh, hey. okay. You know, sorry. Okay, really quick. Tweet of the week. No pie. Oh, it's bean pie. Sorry. Bean pie. No, no. Ew, that's nasty. <laughs> I had to find out what it was. I don't even know. There we go. Okay, the tweet of the week. Oh my word! I have twenty notifications. Oh no, that's you. Okay. Uh, what? Is oh. Elisa Childers? I was on the Elisa Childers podcast. It's like so amazing. I can't even believe it. It's like, I was a guest on my favorite podcast. How is this my life? That's awesome. It really was awesome. Yeah, that was very exciting. So anyways, the tweet of the week is go listen to my conversation with Elisa Childers about mops and the research that I did uh, in that whole endeavor last summer and fall. Um, and you can go check that out on Elisa's website. And so the title of the podcast is, is mop shifting toward progressive Christianity. You can get it on Apple podcasts. Just search for Elisa Childers and you should, people should be subscribing to Elisa's podcast anyways. Cause it's like, pretty awesome. It's a great podcast. It's, it really is my favorite podcast. So she has great content. So that's anyways, it. that's it. Hey, um, we made it to the end. We made it to the end. Please go and check out our website. Yeah. All the things show.com like us on Facebook, all the things show and share, share us. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the like best follow? support we can get. We love, love, love and need the, the shares. Yeah. Help get the word out. Uh, you can catch our podcast on Apple podcast, Google Play, Spotify, mm -hmm. and if they want the video version, they can go on YouTube. Yes. Wow. Hey, like me. You can like me on Twitter. If yeah. you're on Twitter in the Twitter world, connect with me at um what am what am I? The real Monique D. <laughs> I I do go on Twitter. I do. The real Monique D. And you are everywhere as Theology Mom. Yep. Twitter, Bye. Facebook, all Twitter, the things. all the things. Yeah. Um, and you know what? What? We made it. We made it to the end. Yes. And next, next week, week is oh, oh yay, next week. Is the Women in Apologetics Conference. So make sure that you've subscribed to the live stream. If you can't see us in person, if you do come to Biola, y'all better introduce yourselves. Yes. If you come to Biola, introduce yourselves. Um, if you can't get there, have a live stream party. Host, yes. Host some people. Have them over for lunch or yeah. breakfast and lunch. And watch the 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 conference. It's going to be awesome. Natasha Crane's going to be there. Um, Alicia yeah. Wood from Robbie's R R R Robbie Zacharias Ministries. Yeah. We're going to be there. Uh, Lots of people. Yes. Hillary Jane, Jane is going to be there. Gonna Jane Pantic's going to be there. Lori Stewart. Yes. All, all our past, people. All our past guests. All the people are going to be there. <laughs> Don't miss it. It's going to yeah. be so good. But we're still going to have a show next week. Yes. Yes. We will still have a show next week. So. Plus, we may have some spontaneous uh, live streams from the conference. So make sure that you're subscribed and have that notifications bell on. Yes. So. All, all right. right, my friends. Thanks for watching. Peace out. Bye-bye.